Hi everybody, Mary here and welcome to week one of Basic Chemistry. And this week as we start chemistry, we're going to begin talking about classification of matter. And before we even do that, we're going to talk about what is chemistry? You're taking a basic chemistry class. So the definition of chemistry is the study of matter and its interactions. Well, matter is stuff, things that have mass and take up space and how they react when you mix them with other stuff. We've all heard of and seen pictures of chemical reactions, and that's what we talk about in chemistry. It is a huge and massive topic. And one of the things that a lot of students enter a class like this, and then they wonder, why do I need to take this class? What does it have to do with life? Well, chemistry is everywhere. Why is it important? Um, digestion, the food that you eat is all made of chemicals. And how do those get transformed from a cheeseburger into the chemicals of life? Respiration, breathing, the oxygen that you breathe in, how is that converted to the energy that is needed in your cells that allows you to do yoga and exercise and and move actually goes into neurological impulses. Many of us have to take medications daily to keep us well, vaccinations to keep us well. How do those work? Well, those are all chemicals. Something as simple as paint, different elements, different chemicals are made of different colors. Um, and those elements produce different colors. So artist paints. A lot of different technologies that give us things from the metals in our cars, uh, the metals that are used in computer chips, those are chemistry. Batteries that we use in our cell phone, our laptops, all of the lovely electronic devices from flashlights to electric cars to gas-powered cars, all of those are chemical reactions. The chemicals that make up the granites of mountains and the sand of seashores, those are all chemicals with chemical formulas. Lightning sparks all electrical impulses are carried by electrons. Electrons are parts of atoms, and in chemistry, we study those. The water that we drink, we care about the purity of water and things that are bad that happen to be in water. That's chemistry. And photosynthesis that allows a chemical reaction when light energy hits chlorophyll in the sun, excuse me, chlorophyll in plants, and produces energy. So chemistry is important. Chemistry is everywhere. And I hope at the end of the course, you have a wonderful understanding of all of it. But to begin with, we're going to go through the scientific method. Now, you have been through a couple science classes in your life, so you've probably talked about this a time or two. But I want you to understand how important this is in the field of science. There was a time in history before there was science. Somebody had to invent science. And people figured out problems using logic and belief and common sense. And all of that sounds good, but it led us to some weird and, and wacky things. For example, for thousands of years, human beings thought that the earth was the unmoving center of the universe and that the sun orbited around us. Well, we now know that is not true, but it took a lot of scientific observation before we realized that. Thousands of years ago, if a woman was in labor and you wanted to cut the pain, it was commonly believed a good idea to put a dagger or a knife underneath her delivery bed. Now, those of you who have given birth realize that if you had shoved a little knife underneath your bed, that wouldn't have helped very much. It was believed thousands of years ago that women had less teeth than men. Why? Women have, were of smaller stature. Women have more, were more petite. That's not a complicated question. All you have to do is count teeth. But people had a lot of things that were wrong before science actually existed. So in the 1600s, Galileo Galilei, an Italian gentleman with the influence of a lot of other great people, created and began the scientific method. And the scientific method has some very distinctive parts. Now, depending upon the book you read, there might be a slight dis different list, but this is the primary list of things in the scientific method. There is always an observation, a hypothesis, an experiment, and a conclusion. So let's talk about these. 
an observation. Now, if you look at this sweet person over here, how can you tell if someone is ill? If you look at somebody, and you, we've all done it, we look at a friend or a family member and go, oh boy, he or she looks sick. How do you tell? Well, this person over here, you might say it's the red nose, it's the puffy eyes, it's the blankie over the head indicating she's cold, plus the little tissues right there. Those are all good indicators. Now we take all of our observations and we follow that up with a hypothesis. And the definition of a hypothesis is an educated guess. We have background, we have knowledge, and based on our background and knowledge, we make some sort of an educated guess that is our hypothesis. So what do you do to test a hypothesis? Well, you test your hypothesis with an experiment. Now, during an experiment, you always take data. Now, data comes in two different types, and I want you to know these words. These are fair game on our first quiz that we're going to have. The two types of data that occur are qualitative and quantitative. Now, pay close attention to these words, qualitative and quantitative. Now, just listening to these words, which one of these is going to be a type of data that includes numbers. Which one includes numbers? Yeah, that is going to be quantitative data because it has quantity buried inside of that word. So let's say you have these two people and both of them are ill and you want to take some data about their illness. What kind of qualitative data could you take? Well, this fellow looks very pale. Maybe this lady has clammy skin. Maybe she feels hot to the touch or cool to the touch. All of those are qualitative or non-numerical data. What kind of numerical data could you take? Well, you could take heart rate. You could take blood pressure. You could take blood count. You could take um, a lot of medical tests where they give you counts back. Many of us have had tests at the doctors and you get these big printouts of whatever your, your blood work or your urine levels or whatever are, but that's quantitative data. So let's see if you've got this correct. If you understand the difference between qualitative and quantitative data. This is a picture of my cat, Maudie, and I'm going to give you some pieces of information about Maudie, and I want you to see if this is qualitative or quantitative. So the first piece of data is my cat weighs 10 pounds. Is that qualitative or quantitative? Quantitative, because that's a number. Okay, the next one. My cat is brown and black. Qualitative or quantitative? Qualitative, right. There's no numbers involved there. My cat has four feet. Quantitative, that's a numerical piece of data. My cat likes tuna. Qualitative piece of data. Now, all of these pieces of data are important. All of them help us give a full and complete picture of Maudie the cat, but none of them, but some of them happen to be numeric and some of them happen to be non-numeric. There's just different kinds. Now, after you make observations, make a hypothesis, get some data in science, you draw a conclusion and a conclusion is a judgment based upon observations and data. So if we go back to our picture of this person underneath the blankie with the red nose and the tissue, Let's say that our observations, we say this person is ill and they have a cold. Now that is our conclusion and that is our judgment. My question is, are conclusions ever wrong? Well, of course they are. Maybe in our little pretend experiment here, maybe this person doesn't have a cold. Maybe it's allergies. Maybe this person does not is sick at all. Maybe they just had a fight with their significant other and they're sad and they're crying a lot, which would be too bad, but it happens. In science, sometimes we are wrong. And the beautiful thing about scientists are good scientists admit it. Wrong results are also results that help us understand the story. In science, science always requires that there is measurement, there is data, we take numbers, and we continuously and repeatedly test to make sure that we are correct. 
science is not believed, does not totally stem from logic or common sense or belief. Science has to rely on that scientific method. One of my favorite quotes is from Albert Einstein, the great physicist, and he said, no amount of experimentation can prove me right, but a single experiment can prove me wrong. What that means is experiment after experiment could say that what Albert Einstein said was true, but if there's one good experiment that says his results or his ideas were false, what that means is the original idea has to be modified. We now know because of the scientific method that there is more to the story. We have to go back and change our understanding of science. All right, that'll do for this time and we will see you later. All right, bye-bye. Ooh.